Thanks, Heidi. Um, hi, everyone. Like Heidi said, I'm Emma. Um, I currently work at UniSA, um, and I'm really excited to be presenting this workshop to you today on writing for social media. Um, I'm just going to share my screen, um, and you'll be able to see the presentation that I've put together. Okay. Great. So, writing for social media. Um, it's going to be a big presentation, but I'm hoping I can cover the bulk of the key sort of messages in the first 30 minutes of this to allow enough time for questions at the end. Um, so, the agenda for my presentation today, I'm going to give a bit of background information and then I'm going to run through what I think are the sort of the key things to make sure that you're writing to the best of your abilities on social media, which includes understanding your audience, um, tips and tricks, learning how to sell yourself. Um, people always have lots of questions about hashtags, so there's a bit of information about that, um, and ways that you can find out what is or isn't working for you. Um, great. So I thought this was a very good quote to start things off on because I think it's really important that um, everyone realises that it does take time to nurture and work on social. Um, it's not a matter of just doing one thing and going viral um, and hoping for the best. So it is important to be able to have a little bit of time um, to invest in it, but I will do my best to give you some tips for those of you that probably just can't afford to spend all of your time on Instagram and Facebook. So before we start getting into the social media content and writing, there's some key questions that I think um, everyone needs to ask themselves beforehand. Um, and I think a lot of us avoid doing this or just don't really think about it in the rush of um, trying to get posts up. But some important key questions that I think will end up dictating how you approach social and how you approach writing for social are things like why you're using it in the first place, what do you think makes you unique on social? What differentiates you from other people within your, your community? How much time do you feasibly have to spend on your social media? I think that's one of the most important things. Um, what content formats will you or can you use? Like, are you already using video? Is that something you want to get into? Um, you know, are you doing blog posts? That kind of thing. Um, what channels do you already exist on? Facebook, Instagram, TikTok? Are they working for you? Um, and is there anything else you're aspirationally wanting to get onto? Um, and then just the last one, how you manage content creation and, uh, and publication. So I'm trying, gonna try and answer a lot of those questions for you today, or at least how you can go about answering them. Um, so to kick things off, we'll start with a quick overview of the types of content that people wanna share on social. Um, so they cover, I mean, they all relate back to people's values, identities and emotions. So there's lots of different things you can do to hit those different targets. Um, so things like how to content, hints, tips, um, you know, anything that relates to someone as an individual and that they believe in is going to be really important. Um, it's really good to know the why of something before you start. Um, I think that'll help you inform your content in a really great way. So your audience. So this is probably one of the biggest parts of the puzzle. And I think it's a step that lots of people don't think about. Um, knowing your audience actually helps you figure out what you should or shouldn't be writing, um, what the people that are following you care about, what the people you would like to have following you care about. Um, because once you know that information about what um, the people following you are interested in, you're going to get a better idea of what you want to say um, as well as the right kind of tone and voice for your message. Um, there's some really key factors that helps you maintain consistency sort of later down the track. So just sitting down and thinking about who already engages and follows you. So who's commenting, messaging, sharing your content, who's already following you. And if there's a gap there between who is following you and engaging with you versus who you would like to be, like to have following you or engaging with you and how to get there. So there, um, I think this is the most underestimated factor in writing for social media. So I would say this is literally your foundation. This is where you need to start. Um, once you've got that, you can move on to the writing for social component. So writing for social. Um, 
I know there's a lot of information online about do's and don'ts, but I guess this is my core list of what I think is really, really valuable and will help you cut through to your audience. So authenticity is number one. You have to show the human side of your art, your business, your practice. Um, that can mean things like showing behind the scenes photos or videos of your studio, works in progress of your art, the things that inspire you, what other hobbies and interests you might have. You don't need to, you know, be sharing too much of your personal life, but just little things like what else you might be up, up to or interested in outside of your art practice can be really good, a good way of showing who you are beyond your brand. Um, it helps to humanise you and make you relatable so that people see the person behind the brand or the art um, and it will make them much more likely to engage with you. It's probably the number one thing to be thinking about when you're writing is how authentic you're being. Um, and as part of that, I guess part and parcel with that is being yourself. So do you have a wicked sense of humour? Do you love being silly? Um, they're the kinds of things that you need to let shine through in your writing and your content. Um, it'll A, help set you apart, but B, it'll come more naturally and probably make it less difficult for you to think about what to write. You want to be posting content that feels like you and writing in a way that feels like you. Um, you don't need to have perfect grammar or be a copywriting expert or suddenly become super formal. I actually think it's really important to be quite casual and um, informal with your audience, obviously depending on who your audience is, um, but for the most part I think that that's very true. So write about the things that interest you, the stories behind your work, that kind of thing. Um, thirdly, consistency counts. So I'm, when I say consistency, I don't mean you have to post every day. Um, I mean make sure that the way you're writing is consistent. So the type of tone you're using, the words you're using, you know, so yeah, keep that informality across your posts every time you're putting something up. That helps keep it familiar. Um, people will know what to expect from your content. Um, so they'll want to keep coming back because they know what they can get from you. And it'll help foster a sense of community and engagement because they will feel that that sense of community there, knowing, knowing what they're going to get. Okay, so... The fourth point is potentially going to be a bit contentious because I understand that time is probably the biggest barrier for most people when it comes to managing social media because you're expected to do everything in addition to your actual art practice. But I do think that it can pay off to make sure you're writing different content for different platforms. Um, Bearing in mind that, again, it really depends on who your influences are if you have multiple platforms. So, for instance, on Facebook, maybe your audience is 35 plus, and then on Instagram, you have more of an 18 to 24 skew. You might think about the types of things you're going to post or the way you're going to write in a different way because they're quite different cohorts. So, um, I think, yeah, it, it's just worth bearing in mind that that is something in an ideal world that you should be thinking about, but I also understand the reality is that if you need to post the same thing across all platforms, it does, yeah, it's not gonna be the end of the world, but this is my personal recommendation. Um, and lastly, make your audience the center of your social media universe. So don't make everything you post about you, make sure you're thinking about your audience every time you're posting, like what they want, what they wanna hear, what they wanna read. Um, I think that'll make a really big difference to the way you engage with your audience and the way you start to write your captions. And I think a big part of that is what do you like on social media? So who do you engage with and why? So if it's that they are really funny or they're really relatable or they show a really true aspect to themselves or they share really good inspirational posts or whatever it might be, um, even looking within yourself to work out what you like can be a really big key to working out um, a great way to approach your own social media. Okay, so Instagram captions. So this is pretty specific to Instagram, but a lot of these points also apply to Facebook and probably a lot of other um, social media platforms. So in its simplest form, a good Instagram caption is one that provides context, adds personality and inspires your followers to take action. And in the hierarchy of things to think about with these captions, 
this is my breakdown and it's in order of importance basically um or order of things you need to be thinking about so when you think about your caption realistically only the first part of what you write is actually going to show up in your audience's feed so it only allows a certain number of characters so you need to hook them immediately in that first one to two sentences max um, so little simple things can actually make a really big difference here. So if someone else has taken a photograph and you're sharing it, just put the photo credit at the end, little things like that, that's going to put what you're writing first instead of that photo caption. Um, you know, things like putting your hashtags at the end or in the comments, um, make a really big difference, but think about that opening sentence the most, um, because that's, what's going to get people to click more or potentially interact with your post. Number two, tell the story of your work. So tell the story of why you did this piece, what was important about it, what was the inspiration, why you chose to do it, um, how you envisage someone using it or interacting with it or owning it, whatever the case may be, um, that story is going to be part of why people are interested because you're telling a component that they can't see. They can see the image, they can see immediately what it may or may not be. Um, but I think that telling that story is going to be a really great way of getting behind it all. Number three, and this is a really basic one and super easy. A lot of case studies and reports have actually started showing that Instagram users really quite like longer captions. Um, so, but if you're going to post a longer caption, make sure you think about formatting. So when I say formatting, I really just mean adding spaces, paragraphs, that kind of thing, paragraph spaces between blocks of text. You don't want it to just be a wall of text because it's going to be really hard for people to see what's going on and where. Um, so just little things like that can make a big difference, including, you know, if you're putting a list caption together, use emojis as your list starter. It helps break it up and it can be quite visually appealing and it makes it a bit easier for the, the viewer to, to be reading along. Number four, ask questions. If engagement is something that you're interested in, this is literally the easiest way of getting engagement. It's not a guarantee because people can choose whether they comment or not, but asking questions is such a great and easy solution. So you're giving them the easiest opportunity to comment and to also get them thinking about um, your content and posts and maybe they might not engage the first time, but they're likely to come back in the future. So types of questions you could ask if you think that it's maybe not for you. It can be anything from like feedback, like what are their favorite items, products, pieces that you've produced? You know, it can be yes, no, multiple choice questions. So, you know, things that require minimal effort for them to respond, but will make them more likely to respond. Um, you could also do getting to know you questions. So sharing a personal story about your art, yourself, your work, and then asking them to share a similar experience or related story can be really powerful. Um, five emojis, don't be scared to use them. I think a lot of people overthink it a lot of the time. I mean, as long as that aligns with your audience, I feel like I'm gonna come back to that point a lot. Um, it can just be an easy way to A, inject some personality and B, come across as quite relaxed. Um, some studies have also shown that Instagram posts that actually use emojis in the caption have higher engagement rates than those without. Um, so yeah, it can just be, it can, it's one of those things that can't hurt most of the time. Um, number six, if you're putting up a post where it's relevant to mention someone or an organisation, make sure you're tagging them. So tag and mention them. Um, they're more likely to probably share your content that way and you get eyeballs on your profile. Um, so, you know, it can be someone you've collaborated with, if you're doing an exhibition and it's a gallery or other artists that are also exhibiting, you're working with a partner organisation, all those kinds of people are perfect to tag and mention in the comments. Um, I mean, in the caption. So it'll also help run your reach because just you'll literally, people will be coming across your account if those other people share, plus you show up on their account in the tagged post section. And number seven is one of the most important ones. Um, if you want your audience to do something, you need to tell them what that is. So a call to action or CTA, 
um, is literally just a directive. So if you want them to contact you or sign up for a newsletter or attend an exhibition opening or buy some of your work, you, can't, you, you just have to ask them to do it. You need to give them easy instructions for how to do it um, and sh yeah, show them. So the best thing for Instagram is obviously link in bio because URLs don't work in captions and comments on Instagram and it just saves you a whole lot of hassle of trying to post a URL or think about how else to describe that. So um, that's my top seven of what you need to think about with Instagram captions. Um, so I hope that that side of things has been helpful. Um, but then I know that sometimes with authenticity, it's such a, a popular catchphrase at the moment and breaking down what that really means and what it really means in a social media context can be kind of difficult. Um, so these are the things that um, are industry best practice for, I guess, how to achieve authenticity in um, the best way. So I've touched on this before, but consistency. So consistency with the way, the way you write, it helps people to see your content and you as authentic, real and relatable. Um, make sure you're responding and engaging with people. Um, I think it's a really big one that people often forget. So if they're asking questions, get back to them as quickly as you can. You don't have to do it, you know, within five minutes, but whenever you're next online, like make sure that that's what you're doing. Um, write to them in a way you normally would. So how would you answer a question to a friend? That kind of thing. Um, confidence, talk about yourself and you work confidently. That, Conveying confidence in most psychological studies show that it makes people more likely to trust you and it's true on social media as well. So the more confident um, you come across with your work and your practice, the more likely people will be to believe that and come back to you. Um, let your personality shine. It's gonna set you apart. It's what's gonna help make you unique. Um, you don't wanna blend into the background because people won't come back. Um, not everything has to be polished. I think this is a really big one and hopefully allays some fears around um, what professionalism means on social media. I think it's important to make sure when it comes to photo selling your work, that kind of thing, the photo quality needs to be really good. Um, but I also think, you know, something like Instagram stories is the perfect way to share snippets of other sort of behind the scenes or works in progress things that are happening on the fly. Like you don't need to heavily edit those posts and stories. You can just sort of let it feel and look natural, um, which is true of the captions and the writing as well. Um, so yeah, it just makes it come across extra low key and casual. Um, great, so um, self-promotion and gratitude. So often when people are brands share positive things that are happening for them, um, it's because you're feeling excited um, rather than necessarily trying to convince your audience um, or something. So an easy way to make this type of content seem more authentic when you're self-promoting is to bring in an element of gratitude. So who helped with the process? Did you get a grant to fund the work project exhibition? Give a shout out to those people that have helped you or those steps, organizations, processes that helped you along the way. Um, show more than just your work. So I touched on this before. I think it's really valuable. Um, it helps people get to know different aspects of you more than just that one really niche part, which is your art. And I appreciate that that's the brand, but I think it, it's really important. Um, and stories. So by that, I don't mean Instagram stories. I mean the actual story of the product. So tell people where the materials came from, how you manufacture or create what you're creating. Um, how you design the things you want them to buy, how the ideas came to you, how long did it take, all of those kinds of things. People don't know that. That's what's going to be interesting to them. Um, and a final quick tip, which I actually think is really important as well. If you mess up or someone raises an issue publicly with you on social, you need to own it and be honest, transparent and genuine. Um, and if it is raised publicly, you need to respond publicly. Um, I'm sure it's not really going to ever happen, but I just thought I'd throw it out there. Lots of big brands mess up on this one too. Um, yeah, so it's just a really good point to bear in mind if anything ever goes wrong. So emotional writing. Um, I'll share these slides after the presentation with Guildhouse so they can provide them to you because I appreciate that there's a lot of information to take in and you might want to come back to these points. but. 
Um, this little diagram on the right um, is basically like a visual thesaurus. So it sort of covers those core emotional themes of what people are seeking out and why. So everything from newsiness, so, you know, whether it's a, um, it's a topical kind of conversation, and it, I've got in um, my notes here some keywords that go along with all of those, which I think will be really helpful for you all. So, yeah, you'll be able to access that after the show. But things like, um, you know, if you're wanting to come across as topical, you know, discover, exciting, coming soon, announcing, those kinds of, um, that kind of vocabulary can be really, really useful. Um, okay, so this is probably the most classic copywriting formula, attention plus interest plus desire plus action equals engagement. So this, I guess, at the base level is what you need to be thinking about. Appeal to what your audience want, provide a little detail how they can get what they want, connect to the feeling they'll get if they just take the action and then ask them to do what you want. Um, this is particularly relevant when you're looking to um, sell your products. Um, this is a great little um, visual of writing for Facebook and Instagram, just in terms of emojis, character limits, that kind of thing. It comes from co-schedule. Um, but I just thought I'd include it because lots of people um, ask about how long or short captions should be, how many emojis. Obviously, this is a ballpark. It's never going to be super specific. And again, write for the way your audience want you to write and respond to, but um, it's a good overview. Okay, great. Sell, sell, sell. So how to sell yourself. Um, the number one thing, don't feel embarrassed to ask for money for your work because it's amazing and it deserves a place in someone's life. Um, uh, you can focus on the features and benefits. So when it comes to selling your work, you're probably not selling what you think you actually are. I found a great example from a website called The Abundant Artist. Um, and they said, you think you're selling downloadable wedding invitations, but what you're actually selling is hassle-free creative wedding planning. You think you're selling prints of your brother's brim series, but you're actually selling fun, gothic, nostalgia, home decor. So make a list of all the features of what you're trying to sell, how they translate into benefits. So benefits can be, you know, charm, colors, emotions that the artwork evo evokes, that kind of thing. And then from there, think about why you created it or this product um, and sort of go from there. And our earlier tips still apply. Write as if you were talking to someone you know. Write with warmth and honesty. As you write, describe your journey and transformation, all of those kinds of things. Um, and again, the same applies here as just generally in other Instagram captions, headlines, your first impression. Um, it's the equivalent of wearing your best threads to a job interview, basically. It intrigues people, gets them to read on, that kind of thing. Um, be authentic and relatable, even when you're trying to self-promote and sell. Um, you're trying to make them feel like they've entered a, you know, favourite comfy bookshop or a physical store, that feeling you get when you feel really at ease. You want to replicate that in an online space. Um, if you've got an offer, plug that, you know, whether it's some kind of exclusivity, you could add a sense of urgency. Um, and I think when it comes to selling, your art is definitely just part of that. It's going, make sure the imagery you're using does it justice. Um, you do need really high quality, great, intriguing images when you're selling work. And I think that includes things like styling it the way you imagine it in someone's home or someone using it. That's going to help take out a bit of a question for them of what it might be like for them to own that. Um, I wouldn't recommend putting text on your imagery um, when you're trying to sell a product. It's different if you're doing like an infographic type of thing, but um, if you're selling a physical object or a piece of art, um, it's typically not the best. It feels cluttered, it detracts from your work. Plus, just in terms of online accessibility, it's not great. Um, and also, yeah, definitely, definitely call to action. Get them, say the words buy now or register or, yeah, you need to use really proactive language in that way. Um, okay, the only other thing I will quickly mention here, don't make every post you do a sales piece. You need to intermingle it with other type of content so you're not constantly sell, sell, sell. Um, Okay, step five, hashtags. I'll power through this pretty quickly because I genuinely think hashtags are a bit meh. Um, I think they're used as this sort of fail-safe 
easy way to get your content out there. I don't think they hurt, but they're not the only reason your content's going to be out there. And as helpful as they can be, please don't also forget to use features like location tags whenever it makes sense. Um, that actually is huge to making your post quite discoverable. But having said that, here are some key tips. So uh, don't hashtag every keyword in a post. It's distracting, makes posts difficult to read. I know most people don't do this, but I just thought I'd say it anyway. Um, Instagram recommend limiting your post. Um, pick four key hashtags. Don't do too many more than that. Um, I personally recommend posting them as the first comment on your post or at the very least at the end of your caption so that people can read the caption that's quite clean and standalone and then your hashtags come after that. Um, hashtags can help people find your posts, but if there are too many, it'll probably mean your, your content's going to be lost. So if you're picking really popular hashtags, it can and can't work sometimes. Um, I recommend creating a unique one. So if you really want to use hashtags, create something that is unique to your work that is typically only used by you or very few other people and encourage people to then use it. So if they're sharing their experiences with you or your art workshops, that kind of thing, get them to try and use that hashtag so that it generates some content from them and it's not always you. It also means it's easy for you to find and share other content from those people. Um, so use them really and deliberately. And then um, please don't piggyback on trending hashtags that are completely unrelated to your work. The algorithms um, that, AI, uh, that social media platforms use are smart enough to know that and they'll often take your post down. Okay, so this is sort of one of my last slides. Um, how to know what's working and what's not. Analytics. It's like the least exciting part of social media and I know that um, most people hate doing this and finding time for this in addition to finding time to even put the posts up is probably near impossible. Um, but they're really useful to just have a really um, basic idea of what is and isn't working. So first thing, you need your Instagram account to be set up as a business account to be able to even access analytics in the first place. Um, if it's not set up as a business account, you just won't even be able to get that. Um, I've got a link for um, an article from Facebook on how to do that. It's pretty simple. Um, so ideally your goals on social media determine what you're actually going to use to measure its success. So typically for every goal you have, you need a related metric, which will help you determine if you're hitting the mark or not. So engagement. Uh, this is probably my most favorite metric to use to track success. Um, it basically looks at how actively involved the audience is with your content. Um, it basically means the number of interactions you're getting, things like shares, likes, comments. Um, it's a measure of that. So high engagement rates mostly indicate a good audience health. You know, they're responsive, they're engaged with your content. Um, it's important to note, though, that metrics are worthless without meaning. So there's a few questions that could be great to ask yourself when you're looking at these analytics. So what caused any peaks or troughs? what's your next milestone or goal, what factors are you maybe not accounting for, things like day of the week, holidays, popular times to post on the platform, any big announcements you made, all of those kinds of things are going to influence peaks and troughs. Um, reach and number of followers is one that people seem to be obsessed with. Um, overall number of followers in theory means more eyeballs on your content because it's more likely to get shown to more people. But personally, if they're not interacting and engaging with your content, what's the point in having them? I genuinely think you're better off spending time on quality interactions and engagement over a number of followers. Um, optional extras, if you really have the time, benchmark, set your goals for what you want to achieve. Um, it's a pretty simple one. Um, my best suggestion, if you look at what you have been getting in general from analytics with your numbers, add one and a half to it um, and see whether you can get that as a name. Um, time of day is really important. Um, so what time you post. So most of the time, Facebook and Instagram, if you set up as a business, will give you in your analytics the times that your audience is most active. Post, like put your posts up at the beginning of that peak so you can ride that wave so that your content is going to be seen by the most amount of people. Um, and if you regularly share your work and information, make sure your call to action is sending them to your website if it makes sense. It drives more traffic there. 
it helps SEO, all of that kind of thing. Okay, so tips and tricks. Um, this is sort of my final bit aside from some app recommendations. Um, it doesn't need to be polished to start with. If you're freaking out or you have writer's block, just let the word vomit flow. Get it all down. You can refine it later. Done is better than perfect is a pretty good motto, I think, to live by. Um, the best way to make things feel authentic and intimate is to write or speak as if you're chatting or explaining things to a friend. Um, so I always try and picture someone that I know when I write captions. Um, always use a call to action. And I know that writing is in everyone's comfort zone. So if you are struggling or feel overwhelmed, just break it down. So do one part at a time. Think of, sit down if you've got a spare couple of minutes and think about a headline or the first sentence. And then the next time you've got some spare time, think about what image you want to use or think about what hashtags you might want to use. Doing it in a piecemeal way like that can make it feel way less intimidating. If that isn't your style, you can plan ahead. So block out an hour every week or month Whatever is feasible for you, sit down and plan and write a few posts in, uh, in one go. Um, and if you use a social media management tool, you can schedule them in and then you could potentially be set up for the month. Um, if you're on Instagram, you can set up Instagram shop. I think it's a really great, easy way to potentially get direct purchases from people through social media. Um, it also gives you some extra content to post about, which makes your life a bit easier too. Um, if grammar and writing isn't your strength, read your post aloud before posting. Um, it forces your brain to look at your words differently and you probably pick up on mistakes. Um, engagement, this means your engagement with your community. So respond to comments, DMs, engage with people by sharing their content if they've tagged you in something. Um, comment on their posts. If you're getting tagged in posts by other people about your own work, share that. You could recreate a recurring Instagram story where you share posts and photos you've been tagged in that week or month. Um, that helps make people feel special and connected and more likely to come back to you. Um, and my last point is use as many of the social media platform features as possible. They've introduced them for a reason. So go live, try Instagram Reels. Don't be afraid to experiment. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And you probably haven't lost anything in terms of your audience. Um, just play around and have fun with it. And then finally, um, and this might be a good one for you guys to sit with um, afterwards, but I've got a few app recommendations. Probably my biggest one and the only one I'll chat about now is um, Later. It's my personal favorite for Instagram scheduling. So Facebook, you can schedule natively within Facebook, but Instagram, you can't. But Later has a free version, which lets you schedule in in-feed posts. Um, and it also owns link in bio, so you can set that up for free too. Um, and then Grammarly, if you're really paranoid about grammar and writing, <clears throat> it's a free tool that you can um, get like an extension for and it proofreads your posts. Okay, cool. So, um, do we have any questions? Oh, I'll just unmute myself. Emma, if you want to take off your screen share and that way we can really go to the videos. Um, so no one's posted anything in the chat yet. So I might just touch on some of these questions from Eventbrite, which I know you've had a flick through as well and you've obviously covered a lot of these bits and pieces, but I thought I'll read them out in case there's anything that you want to add. Um, so, and yeah, so it, just let everyone know that this is what I'll do and then I'll go to the chat and I can read out your questions. And then if you type, I wanna ask a question, then we'll flip the video over to you. So we've got Meg asking general info about what to write for posts. I find it difficult to think of things aside from earrings. So obviously earrings and jewelry is Meg's practice. And how do I relate anything else to my photos? So yeah, I know Emma, you've talked a bit about yeah, different ways of writing and telling stories. Was there anything else you wanted to add to that question? Um, yeah, I think it's just maybe like even simple things. I think I touched on it, but make like even a dot point list of the things that you loved about making the product or the product itself, who you imagine wearing it, those kinds of things, then you can draw on that um to create a post um I get that it's hard and it gets repetitive but um 
I think if you start to tell that story around why you made that piece or why you think it's great, that's going to bring something different to it instead of just describing exactly what the product is. Awesome. Thank you. And yeah, also just to let um, everyone know if I'm asking your question and there's other things that you want to add, you can either turn your mic on and interject or just type it in the chat because I can't see all of your videos at once. So it's a little bit tricky to know who's here and who's not. Um, so Julie has asked how to find and then get in front of your audience on Instagram. Um, yeah, look, it's a slow process. Um, I don't think there's a single formula that's going to somehow guarantee some kind of immediate success on social. I know that's not the answer that everyone necessarily wants. Um, I do think that this is where consistency comes into it. So be smart with your time and energy. Um, and that's where you need to think about how much time you can put into social, but post frequently, look at who your audience already is. If you've got time, look at, say, there's other artists in the community that are potentially doing similar things to you or approaching things in a similar way. Work out, you know, what you like about their content, what seems to be getting good engagement, um, and then start to adopt those practices for yourself. Um, it, it just takes time and consistency. They're the only solutions. Cool. Sorry. <laughs> no, not at all. I think that's very useful it's yeah it's very eye-opening yeah um so then we've got patty asking about costs so spending money on social media ads like how much to spend and when and how do you know how effective they are yeah okay um it's tricky they're definitely particularly on facebook making it uh, more and more of a thing where you need to spend money to get in front of people um I don't think you need to spend heaps. I do think you could spend a little and it can go a fair way. It can add up quickly too though. Um, so I would probably recommend doing it around things like if there's, you've got a new product launch or you're running a workshop or you've got an exhibition launch coming up, like, you know, do it around with something really key like that. Um, my best recommendation is on Facebook, um, when you set up an ad, if you're doing it through the ads manager component of Facebook, um, you can play around with your audience and your budget and it'll give you an idea of how many people you're going to reach um, and you can sort of see that in the planning stage. You don't actually have to lock in the ad at that point in time, but it gives you a really good sense of how many people you're going to get in front of um, and that will push across through for both Facebook and Instagram. Um, but you do need to think about what your goals are with your, with your advertising. Is it to get the most amount of people looking at it? Is it to push people to your website? Is it to get people to buy something? Because you're going to have to set up your ad in a slightly different way. Awesome. That's really good to know, Emma, that you can kind of like dip your toe in before you spend money and see yeah. you know, what you're going to get. For sure. That's great. Um, so Monica has asked a question, how to write about your art practice. And I know that you've spoken about you know, the, I mean, this whole focus of this session is on writing and you've talked about mm. authenticity and those sorts of things. Um, and also, I just wanted to let Monica know if there's more, because Emma's background is kind of in digital and social media, but if you're wanting to know more about writing about your art practice in general, you can book in for an advice bank session with Guildhouse one-on-one. -on -one. So we can help you with that too, but I will pass over to Emma if you've got other things to add that you haven't already. Um, I don't know, I feel like I'm repeating myself a little bit, but it is about um, just being casual and informal. Like, how would you talk to a friend that isn't in the art world about your art practice? Um, I think if you can think about how you might describe it to friends and family that sit outside of that world, I think that that's the best way to approach it. Um, don't assume that people are going to understand all of the terms or things you're talking about. Um, maybe break it down a little bit and go simple to start with. If your audience is mainly artists, you could probably go a little bit more high level and talk about some quite niche things. Um, but I'm probably assuming that you've mostly got audiences that are a mix of everything. So yeah, I think just going simple, thinking about it from that point of view of what an outsider might be looking for. Um, run things past friends and family as well. Get them to, you know, tell you whether it makes sense, whether it's interesting, that kind of thing. That feedback can be really invaluable. Great. Thank you. And, yeah, as I mentioned, if there are 
if you're wanting to know more, you can always hit us up, Monica, for some more advice. Um, Annette has asked, how, how can we make it less time consuming? So you've talked a little bit about scheduling. Do you have other, any other thoughts on kind of streamlining things? Um, I think I personally find sitting down and doing things in a block makes it so much easier. And I think that is where scheduling is really important. So um, that's where apps like Later and there's heaps of other ones um, can be really, really useful because you can sit down and just sort of do a block amount of posts at once and you can almost let your social run as is. It almost takes care of itself for however long you've scheduled things in for. Um, I think that that is a smart use of your time instead of trying to find an image, write copy and then sit down and post it and do everything in the moment every time you need to when it probably isn't going to be ideal timing. Um, so yeah, either that or again, I think sitting down and just doing little bits at a time makes a really big difference. Um, and work out how much time you want to spend. I touched on this at the beginning, but I actually think that that's one of the most important questions to ask yourself, but be realistic. If you can't spend, you know, every single day or more than a couple of hours a week, that's fine. You just need to work out how to work around that. So you need to plan around what is the most important part of where you should be putting your time in is probably engagement. So replying to comments, DMs, that kind of thing. And then at least getting a couple of posts up a week at a minimum. And then I think, you know, anything in addition to that is great. Awesome. Thanks, Emma. Yeah. Um, so Jackson has asked how best to get people to actively engage with posts. I think you've kind of covered this a bit with talking about that kind of call to action stuff. Was there anything else you wanted to add? Um, yeah, I think, look, if it's on Instagram, it's little things like how easy are you making it for them to engage? Are you asking questions? But then, you know, are you using features like on Instagram stories, you can put up those question boxes and polls and sliders and all of those kinds of really little things. And I know that it seems silly, but people are way more inclined to engage in that way. And the better engagement you get, the more likely your posts are then going to show up in front of those same people that have engaged with you. So um, those little actions that could take you literally less than a minute to chuck up a quick post and be like, it, it can be about anything. It can, you can post a work in progress and be like, what colour do you like better? Or, you know, keep it really simple and easy, but those little engagements go a really long way. Awesome. Thank you. So Ellen, and I know I can see Ellen that you've got another question in the chat as well, but I think I'll just continue flicking through these and then we'll get to that so that I don't miss anything. Um, has just asked about what's the best way to convey information about prices and purchasing work if you don't have an online shop? Um, yeah, look, I think you could set up Instagram shop if that's an option for you. Um, if it's not, I would say, you know, you could either, you could go one of two ways. You could be really, really transparent and put it in the caption at the very end, or you could ask people to DM you for more information. I do think getting them to take an extra action is potentially a barrier though. The easier you make it for people, the easier it is for them to do what you're asking them to do. Um, Otherwise, if you have a website, but not an online shop, you could still put that artwork information on the website, including the cost, and then still link to it in that way so that you're not feeling like you have to provide every aspect of the information in the caption, because then that becomes a lot to sort of fit in. Great. Hope that helps. Thank you. That's great. Um, Neville's question, I think we sort of touched on a bit as well, but asking, you know, understanding that greater returns come from a greater yes. amount of effort. And Neville put a lovely little warning in there that a digital communication specialist may find it disturbing that <laughs> you spend a few hours per fortnight on socials. Um, so, yeah, I think, Emma, you've talked a bit about the things to focus on. Was there anything else you wanted to add to that? Um, yeah, maybe the only other thing, if you can't, um, if you don't want to get a tool that helps you schedule in, bearing in mind Facebook has a native um, inbuilt scheduler, so you don't need anything Facebook, but for Instagram, you do at this point in time. Um, you could come up with your own calendar. You could just like even put it in Google Calendar or whatever you might use, just some ideas as they come up that you could post about on certain days. Um, 
And think about the kinds of content that don't age. So if there's something that could literally be relevant at any point in time, even just jotting down that idea or thinking about that post and planning it out um, might save you when you're sort of stuck in a tight spot. There's nothing worse than that feeling of obligation to put something up, but not knowing what to put up. Great. Thank you. Um, Kristen has asked about engaging vocabulary. I think you've touched on this as well in terms of authenticity and, you know, keeping it casual. And sorry, this was for Instagram specifically. Was there anything else you wanted to say other than what you've already? Um, I do have, like, I think I touched on it briefly on that emotional writing slide. Um, yes. In the notes that I've put together in that, which you'll be able to see when you get the slides, it actually has some examples of some keywords um, around emotional writing um, and different um, keywords that can be really useful. So I think, yeah, you'll be able to hopefully see that when you get the slides. Yes, awesome. And yeah, and just a reminder for everyone too that they'll be able to access the recording of this session later as well. Um, Lauren has asked a question about, I'm not actually sure what the question is in relation to writing. So maybe if Lauren's here, you might want to add something extra into the chat, but it's talking about tips for working in a not-for-profit arts organisation representing artists and community projects. So I am not sure exactly what that question means in terms of tips. So I might go over to the next one, but if you... Lauren's ready to say if yeah you can go ahead Lauren. Oh cool. Um, hello I'm an artist but I also have um, I'm going to be representing Arts in Health at the Women's and Children's Hospital Foundation so I am representing artists so I suppose maybe this isn't the right platform but also just any tips for representing other artists. So you'll be posting about their work? Small um, exhibitions and workshops and projects. Okay. Um, I think a lot of the same tips apply, to be honest. I think that even if you're not the artist, but you might be working for a not-for-profit or you're writing for a workplace that represent art, represents artists, I still think authenticity is really important. Those really core factors around the storytelling behind it, emotional writing, um, being really inclusive, so making sure you use I and you instead of we or third person, I think is a really big part of that. Okay. Um, what yeah. about the tone of the voice? I mean, I'm not, am I still keeping it as casual as I would if I was writing for myself or, you know, I'm representing a quite a conservative organisation in a lot of senses. How would you do it? Um, yeah, look, that's a factor. So the values um, and the background of the organisation you work for is really key. So if they are quite conservative, you probably do need to be a little bit more formal, um, like reflect however they write about themselves is probably a similar tone that you should probably be aiming for. You can probably be slightly more casual than that on social. So when I used to do the social media for the uni, it's quite formal in a lot of other ways, but I was still quite casual on the social media platforms, but that goes hand in hand with the fact that we had a very young audience that were also being very casual in the way they engaged with us. So it's sort of that duality of both the way the organisation views themselves, writes about themselves and who the audience is. So if your audience is okay with it being casual, you know, if they're 18 to 24 or they're young uni students or whatever, it's probably okay to be casual, but maybe if they're older or maybe not, as you know, engage with the art world or whatever it might be, yeah, maybe being a little bit more formal is important. Thanks. That's okay. Great. Thank, thanks, Lauren, for explaining that a bit further. That's really helpful. Um, so also just wanted to give everyone a heads up that quite a few questions are coming through now. And so we'll probably run about 10 minutes over time, if that's okay. Um, obviously, if you need to jump out before then you'll be able to access this session later. Um, but yeah, just to give you a heads up on timing. So Bridget has asked a question about hashtags. I know you've talked a bit about hashtags and what keywords do you recommend to generate search optimization? Um, okay, so two really big questions. Um, so yeah. hashtags, think about one that would work for you and your practice. So 
you know, do you use your art, like your own name as your brand or do you have um, like a brand name that you're using? Those kinds of things can be used in your hashtag. Um, but then looking at what other artists use, um, what hashtags are already out there and exist and get good engagement. Um, I know my answers are probably annoying because it's more work, um, but that's the best way to guarantee that you're getting you're going to get the best possible results um, is by putting in a little bit of that work, even though I appreciate that that's a big barrier. Um, so that that's probably the main thing for hashtags, aside from the other things I've um, included there. Um, and keep them short and concise. Don't make them too long and don't put in any um, anything other than um, words or numbers. So don't put any characters or anything. It'll break the, the hashtag. Um, and then with search engine optimization, that is a massive question and like a whole other field of specialty. Um, but it can be really important to just think about the keywords related to your art practice. So um, uh, trying to weave those into copy is really important if you can, but that's a huge body of work to be thinking about SEO at the same time as social media captions. You're probably gonna already, without even realizing, cover a bit of it. Um, but I think that's where doing things like that list of features, that kind of thing is actually going to be really helpful. Um, in that example I shared in the presentation about, you know, you're not selling wedding invites, you're selling something completely different and working out what it is that people are looking for and then writing for what they're looking for, not necessarily what you're selling. I think that's the way around it. Great. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I still have a few more to read out, as I mentioned, but I thought I would just throw over to Melinda because you've said that you want to ask a question in person and I'm just conscious of time. So did you want to do your question, Melinda? Uh, yeah, thanks, Heidi. Um, thanks, Emma. That's It's been great today. I, I did a project on Instagram a little while ago and um, worked some of this stuff out for myself. Um, including posting under, you know, getting my own hashtag. But what I found was other people then started to use my hashtag and post their artwork using my hashtag, mucking up my, <laughs> you know, thinking this is exclusively me. Um, and I know you can't stop that. Um, that actually wasn't really my question. <laughs> my question was, I'm not actually selling a product I'm sort of selling myself as a person and I have used that Instagram promote um, thing I, I tried it out a couple of times and sometimes it seemed to work and I got lots of new followers and engagements and other times it was nothing and then I noticed that there's all those horrible fake profiles that uh, follow you for a while is there any sort of tricks or tips around that for all the, all the fake people out there? No, is the short answer. Um, but Instagram and Facebook are getting more and more sophisticated with the AI that they use to basically work out whether it's a bot account. So that's why they might follow you for a week and then all of a sudden disappear. Um, also, if they start to comment or send you DMs, just report them before you block them and delete them because then that lets Instagram know that they're a bot account. But Instagram can't control it. So there's nothing really that we can do to do that, um, which I know is super annoying, but um, yeah, they are getting more sophisticated with dealing with it. Um, and then in terms of Instagram promotion, um, I think thinking about what you did that might have worked, whether it was the time that it went up, you know, was it around a time that was relevant for whatever you were posting about or promoting? Um, was it a video versus you know, a photo, all of those little things make a really big difference to the success of something. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. They're pretty similar images. I think it was the countries I chose. They went off better in Latin countries, South America and Spain. Mm. And yeah, it's interesting. Um, it can be really good um, depending on your budget. Um, I know that you can do it on Facebook and I'm pretty sure you can do it on Instagram. You can do a thing called A-B testing. Um, they often let you do it where you um, pick and uh, you should only pick one small difference. So pick a different image, write a different headline, something like that, um, maybe a different call to action. Um, and you can run an A-B test to see what was more successful. 
Um, and then that way you might start to get an idea of what is and isn't working for different audiences. So um, yeah, just make sure you're keeping it to only one change between each version so you can categorically be like, yeah, it was definitely the image. Great, thank you. It's okay. Um, so Rita has a couple of questions, one from Eventbrite and then a couple that have popped up in the chat. So I might kind of give you a list of those now and then I'll go to the, just these next few. So Rita firstly has asked about how important it is to engage with stories as well as posting on Instagram. Yeah. The other question is about she's not able to get reels and whether that's a problem for other people and Ellen suggested it might be her phone and she has a pretty new phone so she doesn't think it's that. Um, and then the third bit is about the Emma that you mentioned, some research, some latest research on the use of Instagram and whether you have a link to that, maybe that's something that you could send to me later and I could pass on. Yeah, I'll try and find it again. I hope I saved it somewhere. <laughs> um, okay, so stories, yes, I think they're a huge opportunity on Instagram. I know it's one extra thing to do. If you do use a social media management tool, um, a lot of them in their paid versions anyway, let you schedule those in advance as well, if that's going to help you save time. But I don't think you have to do it every day, um, but even just a couple of times a week, um, I think it's really important, um, particularly because this can be, stories can be less curated. You don't need to spend as much time thinking about it, making it look really professional. It can just literally be on the fly, snippets of what you're doing in your life at that point in time or um, as you're doing a piece of art or whatever it may be. Um, a good one that can be really simple is just, regularly sharing things that inspire you so other things you found on social from other artists or it doesn't even have to be art related it can be whatever you've come across that might have inspired your work that week um basically it just means you're not having to source your own content or think about what to post but you're putting something up and that can also then be a great way of um putting some of those interactive features on instagram stories of like whether other people are finding it interesting or what they've found that's inspiring that week or whatever it may be um, I think that can be a really easy way around having to try and generate your own um, your own information and post all the time. In terms of Reels having any bugs, it's super possible because it's still a pretty new app. Um, it does have a standalone app. I know that it can be really glitchy. There's lots of feedback online from people that really struggle with its usability in general. Sometimes what happens with newer um, apps is you might actually have to... Um, Sometimes you have a new phone, you might have to downgrade to an older operating system. Sometimes your phone might be more advanced than where the app's up to in terms of bug fixes, which seems really counterintuitive, but definitely happens. Um, I've noticed it particularly happens with Android phones. I've had um, a colleague that really struggled with Instagram itself um, late last year where it was this weird bug that happened and it was because she had the newest operating system on Android. So. Um, I can do a little bit of research and look into it, but I haven't heard of anything substantially wrong with it, but it could just be something like that. Cool. Um, and then the other one that readers asked about, is Facebook worth the effort for artists? It's worth putting in effort to Facebook. I think that's honestly a question for any platform you're on. Yeah. Um, it's a cost benefit analysis for your time versus what you get back for it. Um, I think it depends on the audience you've got on Facebook. It could be that you've just got more engaged people on Instagram. If you've got low engagement on Facebook, don't have Facebook. Like if it's not working for you, it's not working for you and that's fine. I don't think you should feel pressure to have to be on every single social media platform. I just think you need to have at least one. Um, so yeah, look, I don't think that there's a, a general answer for every artist. I'm sure some people find it super successful, but if it's not working for you, don't, don't bother. Cool. Awesome. And that kind of leads into this next question from Veronica, who's talking about, just asking about whether there's a difference in attracting people to buy her art form, which is encaustic wax art paintings on Facebook and Instagram. So she tried having a Facebook page and she didn't really have anyone interested. So I imagine, you know, that might be a bit of trial and error. Veronica, you've also asked about 
how to explain how do you explain in sentences the way in which your promote, paintings promote mental health and mindfulness that might be more of something that Guildhouse can help you with through like an advice bank session um, but yeah do you have anything to add to any of those um, I think it's really important to think about content in different ways. So um, it's not always just writing. You could also think about, is it going to be easier to explain it by um, doing like a little video where you just talk to your phone to explain it? Um, and that might be a bit more of a succinct way. Video typically gets better engagement across all social media platforms. So maybe that's the best way. On Instagram, you could then save it as a highlight if you've shared it to your stories. So that people can always, you could have a bit of an explainer highlight. Um, you could pin it to the top of your Facebook page if you feel like it's a question or a barrier to people understanding your art. Um, I just recommend doing whatever is the simplest, easiest way of doing it. And I think by the sounds of it, video, it could be it. Awesome. Thanks, Emma. Um, Simon, and yeah, just letting everyone know, I've got probably about four more questions. Simon has asked, in Instagram, my reach has lessened. Is this because of changing algorithms? And how do I manage that? Um, always possible. Facebook on Instagram love to mess with algorithms. They tend to do at least one to two major updates to their algorithm per year that they publicly announce. Um, I think there's other questions you could be asking though. Um, has anything else changed recently with your account? So are you posting less frequently? Are you trying out different styles of content? Have you stopped using hashtags? Have you stopped using geotags? Are you mentioning people, not mentioning people in your posts? Um, and are you losing engagement or just reach? Because they're quite different things. Um, and I think if your engagement is pretty steady, it's probably not a huge issue. Um, it can definitely be, reach can be part of the problem and the algorithm can be part of the problem, but um, I'd look at the things you can control and you can't control the algorithm. So I'd just make sure you're focusing on that consistency. Um, the types of posts you're putting out there, what's working and what's not. Put your energy into the ones that are working. Um, and, you know, use all of those basic features like geotags, pick your key hashtags, that kind of thing. Um, it can be a bit of trial and error with social um, when things suddenly change like that. But I think it's worth asking those questions about what might have changed with your own account um, and control what you can control. The algorithm is annoying, but we can't change it. <laughs> Thanks, Emma. No um, so Francis has some questions which I feel like have already been covered, but perhaps if you have anything extra you want to add, Francis, you could let me know in the chat. But these were just about scheduling posts we've talked about. There are some different platforms you can use and targeting audiences. So I'm going to keep moving on, but if there is more that you wanted to add, Francis, please let me know. And Bianca has asked how do I take the fear out of posting it takes me way too long to press go on a post and so much of her work is through word of mouth how much effort do you put into socials um what and how much to share of your own content and of others that's quite a juicy question and I'm conscious of time but yeah if you can sort of touch on a few bits that would be amazing Emma uh, yeah, that's not an easy question to answer, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, look, uh, it can be really scary to put yourself out there. Um, I fully appreciate that it can be terrifying to be on social media um, and making your work, your practice and yourself so publicly available. Um, practice is a big part of that, though. Um, you're not going to fear it less if you stop doing it. Um so I do think it's worth working out what aspect of it scares you. Um, you know, is it that you worry about doing or saying the wrong thing? Is it that you worry about um, the quality of the post, your grammar, your writing? Um, I think if you can identify where that fear is based, you can then work out how to change that fear. Um, if it's just in being on social in general, nothing's going to change it if you don't continue to post it will gradually just get less terrifying um I used to feel this um in one of my jobs at UniSA I used to do email automation and have to send emails to like 90,000 people and it was the most terrifying thing ever um but it just slowly got less daunting and you get gradually more and more used to it um 
things like reading your posts aloud, all of those little tips and tricks, I think go a long way in making you feel more prepared to press publish on what you're doing. And then why are you social? Was that the other part of the question, Heidi? Mm -hmm. um, it's entirely personal. Um, what do you want to get out of it? What is your purpose as an artist, as a brand, as a business for being on social? What are your goals? Um, and can social help those goals? Um, at the very least, I think that there is an expectation from people that you have at least one social media account these days. Um, and it's good for brand awareness at the very least. Um, and I think that people would find it weird if you had absolutely nothing. But um, I do think that it's about working out what platforms work for you, where your time and energy goes, how much time you've got, all of those kinds of things. So sitting down and having an honest conversation with yourself before you start is probably the best thing. And if you're finding it overwhelming because you're trying to do too much, work out what you can drop off. So if it's that Facebook's not working for you, stop doing Facebook and just focus on Instagram. Um, you know, if it's that you've trying to do something every day and you feel like you've only got three hours a week instead of, you know, 30 minutes a day or an hour a day, pair it back to three hours a week and focus on what you can actually put good quality effort and energy into. Thank you, Emma. That's awesome. Uh, so Shervin, I think we've covered, which was how can we use language to get the attention of our audience and make our posts inspirational? So I think Shervin, um, when we're able to share the recording of this and go back to the slides. Emma's got some good content on that. And Genevieve, thoughts on writing as a third person. So I know you've touched a bit on that as well. And Ellen has asked in the chat, I sometimes write social media for my work and then I'm talking about other artists' work. I'm wondering if the casual voice is still okay or if it needs to be more professional. Our socials is uh, often done by different people as well and we don't all have time for it to be one person's job. Um, yeah, that's really tricky. Okay, third person, if you're the artist, right, in the first person, like if your social media is about your specific art practice, always write in first person. If you're writing for a company that's representing artists, it's fine to be writing in third person. That's not a problem. I don't think people would go expecting that organisation to have that artist posting anything. Um, it's okay to be casual on social, but there is a line and it is about working out what kind of organization you represent um, and what is appropriate for that organization. It is really difficult to manage social when it's more than one person doing it and making it feel like it's the same organization speaking. I would honestly say the best thing you can do, which is going to suck because it takes time, is writing um, like a style guide for social for that company. So even if it's, you know, that you each sit down and work out some key points around tone of voice, um, we do one for the uni and it, it gets quite granular. So we do Instagram and it's whether you can swear, whether you can't swear, what emojis you can and can't use how casual you're allowed to be, that kind of thing. And I think those little things will actually help because you can all reference back to that um, to try and bring in a little bit of consistency, um, you know, and even formatting, like making sure that you all format your posts in the same way. So putting those paragraph spaces in, putting credits at the bottom, are you going to put hashtags in your caption or are you going to put it in your comments? All of those little things are going to make it seem more consistent. Awesome. Thanks, Emma. I think our lucky last question is from Patty, who asked, with fear of sounding ageist, if insights reveal a lower age cohort, how to get an older audience who are more likely to be collectors? Um, look, it is really hard to target a specific audience on social media without paying for it. Um, that's the crux of the problem um, because... Facebook and Instagram is set up to make money for Facebook and Instagram. And the way they do that is by getting people like you guys to um, do ads. Um, and when you run ads, you can actually specific a really particular age group and demographics. Um, if you don't have the budget to do an ad, um, I would look at what hashtags you're using. Do you follow 
the galleries or the collectors or the exhibitors that might be the ones that you can um, that you want to be engaging with do you comment on their posts do you share their work do you engage with them um, that helps your um, content get in front of them because they're going to notice you um, but again it's a really annoying one where it takes time and effort you've got to work out what what works for them but write for the audience you want as well that's really important 